Good afternoon, everybody. So, everybody enjoyed the lunch? Yeah? Has anybody been here for the three days? Yeah? How is it eating out of small bowls all the time? It's, it's quite hard work, isn't it? So it's good food, but eating out of small bowls is hard. So last night, we decided to go and have some duck. So if anybody likes Peking duck, there's an amazing place around the corner. Anyway, so let's kick off this. So I'm going to talk about CBDC. So Anthony Welfare, I've been doing this for around seven years, Enterprise Blockchain, Oracle, DXC, and then I've been at Ripple for around about 18 months working with the CBDC team. Um, Ripple, so Ripple has grown massively. And bear in mind the background of the world we live in, we're now 800 people in 15 countries. 18 months ago, this slide used to say 350 people in eight countries. So despite everything that's going on in the world, our business is growing massively. And I think that's a really important sort of understanding of where we are. Obviously, our main business is cross-border payments. Um, so we have RippleNet, or now called ODL, which is basically cross-border. And we're processing billions of transactions through that in a very efficient way. Um, the other part of the business, which is, is where sort of I sit, is called RippleX internally. And it's all about using the XRP ledger. Okay? So the XRP ledger is a decentralized network, and it's built for payments fast, cheap, efficient payments. And so that's what we're starting to build lots of products on. CBDCs is what we're looking at at the moment. So let me give you a history from chickens through to digital currencies. So obviously, we've all seen the evolution of money, where it's come from, bartering, plastic cards, credit cards, all those good things. At the moment, we're sort of the second to the left. Most of the money we use in our daily life for fiat is actually electronic money, okay? What we're moving to is digital currencies, okay? So digital currencies, we look at three parts. First of all, the left-hand side on the screen is cryptocurrencies. So Bitcoin, Ethereum, XRP, et cetera, we all know cryptocurrencies. There's literally thousands of them. They're, digi they're pure digital currencies, and obviously they're on different networks using DLT technology. In the middle is stable coins, and you could sort of split that into two. Nearer to cryptocurrencies is unregulated stable coins such as USDT, USDC, EuroC, etc. That's been put together by different financial institutions or different networks. If you look to, the, say, the, the left-hand side, the right-hand side, um, nearer to CBDCs, we call them regulated stable coins, okay? We sit here today and we don't have, <laughs> generally in the world, anything that is regulated stable coin. Obviously in Europe, Mika is trying to get us near to that. Hopefully, over the next few months, um, we actually get to that stage that we know what a regulated stable coin is. To me, it's very simple. A regulated stable coin is one euro digital coin is backed by one euro Imagine, you know, imagine it in a central bank or the commercial bank. So there's one euro physically in the bank. Obviously, it's not physical in these days. So that's what we class as regulated stable coins. And then obviously CBDCs. So these are central bank issued currencies. Now, we don't look at it and say that every central bank will issue a digital currency, a CBDC, that we use, that we buy our food and water with. It could easily be via a commercial bank or a, a, you know, a fintech institution. So we don't look at the, the model being disrupted as people think. Generally, people think a CBDC is going to be a central bank getting rid of commercial banks and <laughs> getting rid of the system. It, it just cannot happen in any decent size to large countries. It's just fairly impossible. So we still see a similar system, similar, not the same as today. We still see commercial banks, payment providers having a, a, a part playing, you know, a role in this new ecosystem. Really importantly, we, we sort of forget why we're using DLT blockchain for CBDCs. And, uh, you know, bearing in mind the, the crypto asset conference yesterday and where we're moving to today. 
the benefits of a distributed ledger is, is sort of self-explanatory, um, you know, from all the networks, but this is specific, obviously, to XRP ledger. Global interoperability and scalability. So you can interoperate, you can grow, you can move money, move assets quickly around the world. Securely allowing participants to join a network. You know who is joining the network and what they're doing. That's really important when you're transacting with money. Transactions settle in real time, so it's less than three seconds on XRP ledger, and it's settled. Now there's discussions around, do you need three second settlement, really? Maybe you don't, actually. Maybe you can do it within hours or days, et cetera, but the technology can do that. High resiliency is security. We're talking about our, our currency, you know, the, the currency of a country. So there's no single point of failure, and there's multiple instances of the information. That doesn't mean everybody sees everything, but you can share a certain information with certain nodes and set it up in different ways. But in essence, if this section of the nodes breaks, this one's okay. And you've got the resiliency, you've got the backup. And then also real-time transparency. If you asked um, a central bank how much money they have in circulation at this very second, they can't tell you. They, they'll have a good estimate, but they can't actually tell you exactly where the money is and, and how big it is, etc. If you think of some of the, um, let's call it real-time crises we've just had in the last few months, the pension issue in the, US, in, the, in the UK, and then SVB, when you read through it, it sounds as though it was minutes. There was a few minutes where it then went really bad. That's why things like CBDCs and stablecoins can help, because you can input liquidity within seconds and actually help or, you know, stabilize the system. Because that's what SVB was, and I believe, I don't know enough about the, the pension crisis in the UK, but my understanding is it's a similar type of scenario. That's really important that you have the transparency, you can act within seconds. And then finally, this is, this is what my tech people call it, but I do like this way of describing a DLT. Today's systems are designed with a per perfect path in mind. So all our systems are designed so that everything works. And then we have checks and balances, audits, reconciliations at the end. DLT does it the opposite way. These networks were built for everything to go wrong, to be self-resilient and fix the problems and make things you know, happen uh, when they go wrong. So a distributed ledger is built for an imperfect world. And you know, we do live in a probably fairly imperfect world at the moment, probably something we didn't think even three or four years ago. You know, the things that have happened are, you know, nobody could forecast them. What's the impact of a CBDC? I'm not gonna go through this slide in detail because literally it would take me the next day or two <laughs> to do this. But on the left-hand side, what we've done is said, what is the difference to traditional money, okay? In the middle, the benefits, and then the industries. The industry is easy because it's all industries eventually will be impacted. But if you look down the left-hand side, you know, direct access, there's no intermediary required. I'm not saying you get rid of intermediaries. You still need custody, you still need loans, you still need financial products. But they're not required, so you can do things in a different, more efficient way. Programmable money, programmable payments. You can program the payment or the money to do different things that you want, good or bad, okay? There's lots of discussion around that. The technology can do this. It's down to what the country would want to do. Controllable transparency or privacy, highly, highly important, especially in Europe, especially in Germany. It's one of the most important topics. Privacy can be controlled how we want it. So if the government wants full transparency of every transaction, they can have that. Or if they want little, trans uh, little transparency, they can have that. It is down to the design of the, the CBDC and the stablecoin and what the country wants to achieve with it. And then finally, it restructures the cost base. So if you think you know, the payment system today is slow, and it, it costs a lot of money. There's lots of different stages. You know, yes, I can go and buy a coffee now, and the money goes from my Euro account, and I get my coffee. That isn't instant, because there's a whole back-end system that actually probably takes three days for it to go through if you're using credit cards, et cetera. So 
That cost can be reduced using DLT technology, CBDCs, and stable coins. It won't go to zero. You know, people still have to pay this. Maybe in five, six, ten generations, and we're all doing P2P payments with a wallet, maybe that cost does go down very well. But I think that's a generational change or a number of generations. So what are we learning? So we've got two announced um, projects, and then we've got five under NDA. Um, Royal Monetary Authority of Bhutan is a real CBDC, so there's a central bank, and they've issued a currency, and that's very much uh, at decent stages at the moment. And Palau is actually a US dollar stablecoin. So Palau has its own government, but no central bank, so they use the US dollar. So we're issuing um, on the public blockchain, on the public XRP ledger, a USD stablecoin for this country to use. That's actually quite in interesting for innovation because there's other things can be done with that and we can do a lot more interesting things. Um, what have we learned so far? <laughs> Obvious first point. Um, very different approaches from central banks, like completely different in some cases. Some are similar, some are different. Some of it depends on the size of the country, the jurisdiction. Quite often it depends on uh, regulatory issues, uh, monetary policy, and then technology adoption. You know, there's countries that everybody uses the mobile phone, and there's countries that still, it's 80% or so. When we go into work with the central bank, developing the wider ecosystem is really critical. This is not just about the central bank, this is about the entire payment network, so the commercial banks, the payment providers, the payment networks, etc. So we work together as much as possible so that everybody can work on what this CBDC looks like for each country. And obviously commercial banks are highly important in that. They still do the vast amount of the work in our financial system. When you get to retail payments, it's really complex. Um, and <laughs> I, I'm from a retail background. I spent 25 years in retail, so I knew this before I went into payments. But lots of people realize now that actually making payments, very small payments through an EPAS, you know, a credit card or a payment, has lots of complexities. So that sort of last mile, last minute, last second of the payment is really complex. Adoption plans for the country are critical. So we've seen a number of um, launched CBDCs which haven't gone very well. Some of them could have been some technical issues. The majority of them, when you step back and review them, is actually the adoption plans weren't put in place. Why does your country, why do your citizens want this? Why are they going to use it? Because you've got to find the benefits and the reasons for it. Otherwise, what's the point? I'm not going to download, I, I live in Portugal, I'm not going to download a Bank of Portugal, you know, CBDC, when I can just use my account. Why would I do that? So there's a whole education. It's very different in the Western world and the developing world. You know, so, so there's still the financial inclusion part. But we do need to start thinking about this for Europe and America, etc. And then finally, being specific as possible. What are you trying to achieve? So we only work with the central banks when we have a use case what do you want to achieve with the CBDC? Let's put it in and try that, be it cross-border, be it remittances, be it government payments, be it uh, benefits payments, etc. So there's a whole range, but let's just put that in, test it, get it working, and learn from it. As I said, use case focus, and we call them real money pilots. So we really only work on real money pilots, which is actually transacting somehow. So in Palau, we did our first transaction, I think it was in December last year. Um, so we get to the transaction stage where it's either bank to bank or this was retail to a, a bank. There's three, three sort of core areas, the main areas, bank to bank, um, which is wholesale CBDC. Everybody's been talking about that's probably technically one of the easier ones because it's bigger payments. Um, but it's also still complex, different systems, different processes. Um, cash alternatives, so they're paying for your coffee, paying for your rent, etc. Probably the most complex by far. And I think that's quite a long way away. I don't, that's not imminent by any means, unless it's a very small country. And then the whole cross-border world. I mean, obviously, Ripple is 10 years in cross-border, so that's a lot of what we focus on, the majority of our business. Um, but we need to cross-border, we need to interoperate these. So not every country is going to have a CBDC, not every country is going to have a stablecoin, some will still have fiat. 
So over the next 20 years, it all needs to integrate and pay. Otherwise, we'll have the same inefficient system today as we do in the future. So little you know, improvements on this cross-border is really important for all central banks. And then finally, the main themes for this year. Um, amazing that I'm going to say it, regulation. I mean, you know, the one thing that we want to get is some clarity and some regulation. Good regulation as well, not bad regulation, obviously, because bad regulation is not going to be good. Um, and, you know, see, we see stablecoins 100% existing with CBDCs. Now, what level, what percentage, each country will decide. Industry collaboration on interoperability is important, massively important, because if we all build our own CBDCs and stablecoins and ignore everyone else, guess what? Cross-border is going to cost a fortune. We all live in a world where we're actually using different currencies or we've got family in different countries, etc. Um, and that's at a tech level policy and integrating with current systems. You know, we're not getting rid of the fiat system in the next few years, maybe if ever, I don't know. So we still have to integrate with how you do things today. Privacy, I mentioned this before, you know, we need to look at the privacy opportunities and develop the right options for this. That is really at each country level a very detailed, very serious discussion. Um, just remember though, with privacy is we all have a mobile phone and we're all doing things with that phone. So actually, and if we've got Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, et cetera, most of our data is being shared and being used. You just don't know about it as much. Now, you know, do I want the central bank knowing that I buy a coffee? I don't care. Like if Christine Lagarde wants to pay for my coffee, she can do. You know, it's, privacy is, is relative to what we want, but we do need some good discussions. Um, I've been talking to a few people the last couple of days, education, 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 education. People still don't understand cryptocurrencies, they still don't understand stable coins, and CBDCs are even more complex. So we really need to educate more and more um, on this, what it is, what it means, and what people need to think about and decide and sort of work on. And then finally, what we're seeing this year is the, the larger partners, the bigger you know, players in this, this sector, be it the commercial banks, uh, be it the big tech companies, etc. they're all becoming interested. So this shows us that there's real adoption coming. And over the next few months, this will start to become a reality. The digital euro is always the question I get asked. When do you think the digital euro is coming? It's a long way off. I can't see how we move from all the research to making a decision for 26 countries and the rest of it in a short space of time. But, you know, there's a will to do it, and there's also external reasons to do it. So, um, so yeah, there's a, a lot of positivity in the future. Stable coins are just as important as CBDC. So thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>